Tonight's presentation is called Death's Mystery Solved. And before we begin the subject tonight, I'd like to ask you to please bow your heads with me as we have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, tonight as we study the Bible again, it's my prayer that the Holy Spirit would guide us and lead us into all truth. So as we open the Bible, we ask for this gift, and we ask for it in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We've been looking at some very, very specific truths in the Bible, and some of you have told me that some of these things are kind of new for you, and I just want to remind you again, please, if it's true, and it's not true because I say it, it's not true because we presented it in the seminar, but if it is true, don't be afraid of the truth. Amen? Okay, I want to talk tonight about death, but in order to do that, we need to understand how God made man in the beginning. So I'm going to take you back to how the first man was made. It's found in Genesis chapter 2. It's in verse 7. And please notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the what? Of the dust of the ground. And then it says, And he breathed into his nostrils. What did he breathe? The? The breath of life. The Bible says, When he did those, when he did that, man became. Please notice that word. Man became, the Bible says, a what? A living soul. Now, I don't, I don't want to overemphasize this, but it's important to understand this. I'm going to just put this formula on the screen. When God made man, the Bible says he took dust, he breathed into that dust the breath of life, the Bible says. And when he did that, the Bible says man, now please notice, it didn't say he got a soul. No, it said he became a what? A living soul. Okay, so... This is an important point I need to make very early in the seminar tonight, and that is this. In the Bible, a soul is not something that you have. Okay, let me make that point again. In the Bible, a soul is not something you have inside of you. It is you, okay? You are a soul. And I want to show you the usage of this in the Bible. Please notice in Acts 27, verse 37, and we were in all, in the ship, 260, three score, and 16, what? Souls. Is, was a, is this a ghost ship? No, what's this thing? It's that in, in the ship, there was 276 what? People. Does that make sense? Because a living soul is a word for a? A person, okay? So that's what the Bible's saying. Here's another verse, Exodus 1, verse 5. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls. Now, folks, when the Bible uses the word soul here, it's simply saying that it was a person or this was his children, right? You know, since I've been in Iloilo, I have visited, you know, the big uh, Shumart, right, the mall. I've been to, is it Geisha? Geisha? Anyway, I've been to some of the malls here. Very nice city you have, by the way. Anyway, have you ever, maybe you went shopping one day, and uh, your boyfriend or spouse asks you, how was shopping? And let's just suppose that it was empty at the mall. And you might say something like this. You know, it was interesting. They were having a sale today, but I did not see a single soul. Now, when you use the word soul there, you're using it as a soul is a person. Do you see that? So even in our modern vernacular, the usage of the word soul is synonymous with a person. Let me give you one more usage of the word soul in the Bible. And I just want to point this out because it's important to understand just as we reference other parts of the Bible. Jesus said, for whosoever will save his what? Life. Now, I'm going to explain why I'm asking you to emphasize that word. Shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And then in verse 26, Jesus said, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own what? Soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, here's an interesting fact. In these two verses, the word life is mentioned twice, and then the word soul is mentioned twice. In the original Greek language, it is the exact same original Hebrew, uh, sorry, Greek word. And in this, in the usage of it, you can see that the word soul is interchanged with the word life. Okay. So now I want to talk briefly about this 
thing that God breathed after he formed man of the dust. The Bible says that God breathed into his nostrils. What did he breathe? The the breath of life. I want to talk about this breath of life. And before I do that, I need to give you a little explanation about Hebrew poetry. So on the screen tonight, you have Job 33, verse 4. Some of you may know that the book of Job, scholars say, was the first book ever written. And Moses wrote it, okay? So book of Job, first book, Moses wrote it. He wrote it, they say, when he was a shepherd in Midian. And it is actually a book of poetry. It's not prose, it's not history, and it's not like Proverbs. It is actually a book of poetry. Now, what's interesting is that Hebrew poetry does not rhyme like we do, okay? Like, you know, in in our modern uh, English we say like, roses are red, violets are blue, daffodils are yellow, and I love you. So like the blue and the you rhyme, right? But in, in Hebrew poetry, it doesn't work like that. In Hebrew poetry, they didn't try to rhyme words, they tried to rhyme ideas. Please notice this. The first line says, the Spirit of God hath made me. That's line one. Then the second line says, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. Now, notice there's two lines. I want you to notice how this works. In the second line, do you notice that there's this expression, given me life? Can you please tell me in the first line, what expression is the same, the mirror image of that? What's the same expression? Made me. Do you see that? So, given me life is the same as made me. In the second line, it says the Almighty. In the first line, it says... God. Do you see that? In the second line, it says the breath of the Almighty, which means in the first line, the same expression is the the Spirit of God. So here's an amazing fact. In the scripture, the breath of life is synonymous with the Spirit of God. I'm going to show you another example. Job 27 verse 3, the Bible says, all the while my what? Breath is in me. And then the Bible says, and the Spirit of God is in my where? Nostrils. Again, Hebrew poetry, we see again, breath is being synonymous or mirrors the Spirit of God. By the way, where does it say the Spirit of God is in this verse? Where? Where is it in your? Nostrils. Now, please notice this. In Genesis 7, 22, the Bible says, all in whose what? Nostrils was the what? The breath of life. Now before, in Job 27 verse 3, what was in the nostrils? Nope, nope, nope. The Spirit of God was in the nostrils, but now in Genesis 7 22, it says what was in the nostrils? The breath of life. Either you have two things in your nostrils, or the breath of life and the Spirit of God, they are the, they're the same thing, right? Okay, James 2 26 lets us know that the breath of life is really in essence the same thing as the Spirit of God. For as the body without the spirit. Now, please notice, this is the opposite of creation because at creation, God formed the body and then he breathed into it, what? The breath of life, which is the same thing as the spirit. But in James 2.26, the Bible says, if you take a body and you remove the spirit, then the body is dead. Okay, Psalms 104, verse 29, describes this also. It says, thou hidest thy face... And they are troubled. It's speaking of animals. Thou takest away their what? Breath, and they die and return to their dust. This is creation in reverse. Verse 30 says, Thou sendest forth thy spirit, and they are created. So again, spirit and breath, they are used together. And let me explain why. In the Old Testament, the usage of the word breath comes from the original Hebrew word ruach. And this Hebrew word, ruach, it actually is translated as either breath or spirit, okay? So again, that's why they are used interchangeably. But let me point something out that at this junction is critical. The word spirit and the word breath, I'm sorry, the word spirit and the word soul are never used interchangeably. And I want to point this out. In the Bible, the spirit or the breath is the life-giving power that God gives that gives you life. But a soul, what is a soul again in the Bible? It's a, it's a person, okay? They're completely different. So what happens in death? Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 7 tells us, when a person dies, then shall the dust return where? 
to the earth as it was, and the spirit, or the, another word for it is the? The breath of life shall return to? To God who gave it. So let me put this formula. If you have a person and you take away the breath of life, then you just are left with a corpse. Let me give you a verse in the Bible that describes this. Stephen, one of the seven deacons, as they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my what? My spirit. And please notice what the Bible says. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this into their charge. And when he had said this, what happened to him? He fell asleep. That's what the Bible says. He fell asleep. I'm going to use a very crude illustration. Please don't read too much into it, but I'm using this to just illustrate in a very simple way how death works. Here we have many lights. And, you know, this is pretty high tech here, but the point is that most lights, the old lights, they have like, you know, a filament, right? And electricity runs through. Okay. So let's just suppose that a light here is an example of a living person. Well, what happens when you cut the switch? What actually happens when you cut the switch? Now, there is no longer any what flowing to it? No electricity, right? So, when you take the electricity out of the bulb, now you're just left with an empty bulb. Does that make sense? As crude as that is, it illustrates what happens in death. You have a living person, a body, plus the breath of life. When death happens, it's simply that the life-giving power goes back to the source, and the body, it decomposes back into the dust. Jesus name, uh, talks about death in these words. These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus, what is he doing? He sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his Death. Now, I want to ask you a question. What did Jesus call sleep? He called, I'm sorry, what did Jesus call death? He called it a, a sleep. Very interesting. The Bible says, how be it, oh, sorry, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. I'm going to jump down to verse 23 in this chapter, and I want you to notice what Jesus said to Martha. Jesus said unto her, thy brother, what are the next three words? shall rise again. Now, please notice this. He had been dead for four days, and Jesus said, your brother shall rise again. And then in verse 24, Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the what? In the resurrection. When does that happen? At the? At the last day. Now, please note that. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me Though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now in verse 43, when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, do what? Come forth. Now I'm going to mention this later in the program, but just remember that when he called Lazarus, he said, Lazarus, do what? Come forth. Okay. In the Bible, over 50 times, the Bible calls death asleep. I haven't listed all the references, but it's quite common throughout scripture. Death is like asleep. And I'll explain why that is a little bit more later on. But the question now that we need to answer is this. Is death something that we should fear? Have you ever noticed this? All throughout Hollywood, the ultimate fear is always death. Have you noticed this? This is the foundation of all horror films. It's always this this innate fear of death is the premise. But this is what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. I am, this is Jesus speaking. He said, I am he that liveth, and was what? And was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the what? The keys of hell and of what else? Of death. Friends, what does, who, what, what does the Bible say Jesus has as far as death is concerned? He has the keys. Now folks, I think you know this. When you possess the key, it means you have authority over something. Does that make sense? So when the Bible says Jesus has the keys of hell and death, it's simply saying that Jesus is in charge of death. Can you say amen? By the way, that means, that implies if you give your life to Jesus, you do not have to fear death. Isn't that right? Okay, so then the question is, how much do people know when they die. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 5 says this, for the living know that they shall 
die. Everybody, all of us here today, we know that, right? But then the Bible says, but the dead know not how many things? Not anything. Now, folks, I want to pause right here because today it would seem that there is great confusion, even in Christianity, about this very fact. The Bible says that the dead know how much? Not anything. And let me keep reading. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, speaking of the dead, and their hatred, their envy, is now what? Perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Here's a question that I have for you. So suppose that you buy a home. And let's say that someone before you lived in the home, but they died in that home. Would that person, according to the Bible, be able to come and bother you because you bought their home or you took their own? Can they bother you, yes or no? Absolutely not. The Bible says their love, their hatred, their envy is now what? Perish. The Bible says the dead know not anything. Which means, now please don't miss this, you cannot consult the dead to ask them about the lottery numbers. Amen? That's true, right? You can't ask the dead about who you should marry or where you should go to school. Or, you know, what you should do for your next job. No, why? Because the Bible says the dead know how much? Nothing. Nothing. That's very clear what the Bible says. Let me give you some other verses. How much do the dead know? The Bible says his breath goeth forth. This is, remember, the Spirit of God. He returneth to the earth in that very day. In other words, when a person dies, in that very day, what happens to his thoughts? They perish. In other words, they die. Psalms chapter 6 and verse 5. For in the grave, in death... There is no remembrance of thee in the grave who shall give thee thanks. Now today in Christianity, it seems that many people are being taught that as soon as you die, you go straight to heaven. But when you read the Bible, if you read it carefully, you will begin to see that this actually contradicts many clear truths in the Bible. I'm going to show you one of them. Acts 2 verse 29, the Bible says, Men and brethren, this is Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost, He said, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both, what? Dead, and what else? Buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Verse 34, the Bible says, for David, what are the next three words? Is not ascended into the heavens, but he said himself, the Lord uh, said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. Job asks this very question, where did the dead go when they die? The Bible says, but man dieth, and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost. Now notice these next four words. And where is he? That's the question we're asking. Where do the dead go when they die? Do they go straight to heaven? The Bible says in verse 11, as the waters fail from the sea, and the flood decayeth and dryeth up, so man lieth down, and what? Riseth not. Until the heavens be no more, they shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. That's what the Bible says. Verse, tw- uh, sorry, Psalms 115, verse 17. The Bible says, the dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go where? Where did the dead go? Go down into silence. Now, please note this. This is when Jesus comes in Matthew 25. The Bible describes this scene. Please look at it carefully. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory. When is that? The first or second coming? Which one? That's the second coming, right? When the Son of Man shall come in His glory. And all the holy angels with Him. Then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all nations. And He shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. And now please look carefully in verse 34. Then, in other words, at that time, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand. Who are on the right hand? The the sheep, the righteous, right? Then shall the king say unto them on the right, on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the what? The kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Folks, does it make sense? Jesus wouldn't have to say that if when you died, you went straight into heaven. He wouldn't have to say that. Why? Because you are already where? In the kingdom. Does that make sense? But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says when Jesus comes and he separates the nations, at that time he will invite the righteous to come in to inherit the kingdom that was prepared for them from the foundation of the world. So then when does the Bible describe this 
resurrection to take place. Please notice in John chapter 5, verse 25, and the Bible says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Verse 28 says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are where, where are they? In the graves. Please notice Jesus says where the dead are there. All that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Now this is important for tomorrow night's subject. We're talking about the thousand years in Revelation. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of what everybody? Of life. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of? How many resurrections did Jesus say that there were going to be? How many? Two resurrections. Let's name them. The resurrection of? Life, and obviously that's the resurrection of the righteous, and then the resurrection of damnation, and that is the resurrection of the wicked. Tomorrow night, I'm going to show you from the Bible, the book of Revelation, where these two resurrections take place. And that's important for you to know, and I'm going to show you tomorrow night how you can be part of that first resurrection. This is Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, and here's what the Bible says. He writes, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now, when he says sleep, he's talking about death. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed. Now, who doesn't die? Well, at, right before Jesus comes, there will be a group of people living on earth. Does that make sense? So he thought he was going to be part of that. But we shall all be changed. When? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last, what? Trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, what? incorruptible and we shall be changed but please look carefully how will we be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality now look carefully at verse 54 so when this corruptible which means this mortal shall have put on incorruption which happens at the second coming and this mortal shall have put on immortality then, in other words, at that time, at the second coming, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now, folks, does this make sense? If you died and went straight to heaven, that wouldn't be true. Because as soon as you die, then death would be swallowed up in victory because now you're in heaven. But the Bible says that when Jesus comes, when the last trumpet sounds and that trumpet blows and the dead in Christ are raised, at that time, the expression comes true, death will finally be swallowed up in victory. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, the Bible reminds us again, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And when that trumpet sounds, the Bible says, And the dead in Christ shall what? Rise first. I'm going to tell you a true story. There was a young girl, about nine years old, that went to her aunt's funeral. It wasn't her mom, it was her aunt. And because she was family in the States, they put the family on the front row. So if you've ever seen a great side service, they have the casket there. Preacher comes, they have the family there, and then the, you know, the other relatives. And then whoever else is there, they all stand around the tent. So this young little girl was sitting in the front row, and she heard her you know, mother crying, and then she heard the preacher she heard what he was saying as she was listening she started getting confused you know she was getting this question in her mind so finally she got the courage even though her mother was crying she got the courage to tug on her mother's skirt and she turned to her mother and she said mom where's aunt sally so the mother in the midst of her tears she looked down at the little girl and she said Aunt Sally is in heaven. Because that's what the preacher said. So the little girl, she was a smart girl. She was thinking about this. And then she was looking at the casket. And she had heard what the preacher said. And so after about 10 minutes, as people were filing past, she again tugged on the mother's skirt. Mother was starting to get irritated, but she tugged on the mother's skirt, and this time she asked a second question. And this time she said, Mom, and she pointed to the casket, and she said, who's in there? That's a good question, right? <laughs> so the mother was not prepared for this second question, and she was getting irritated. 
But this time, when she thought about it, she gave this reply. She said, "That is Aunt Sally's body." So the little nine-year-old girl, she processed that fact. She began thinking more. And you know, something just didn't make sense. The first question was answered. The second question was answered. But in this little nine-year-old mind, this still did not fit. So this time, after another ten minutes or so, the young girl got up enough courage, and she tugged on her mother's skirt one more time. And this time, she asked a very important question because now she said, "Mom, is Aunt Sally in heaven right now, without a body?" <laughs> now, folks. We laugh and we think that's cute, but you know what? That's a very interesting question. Do you know why? Because if you follow traditional Christian theology that says if you die you go straight to heaven, you miss a very important point. And that point is, if that really is true that you die and go straight to heaven, why does Jesus need to come back and resurrect anybody? After all, there are already would be all where in heaven. But that's not true. The Bible says that the dead are simply where? They're in the graves. They're all asleep, awaiting one of two resurrections. If you come tomorrow night, I'm going to talk about that. Now, some of you are thinking, "Wait, where do the people that are lost go when they die?" Now, in our seminar, we're going to talk briefly about hell, and I'm going to share with you about that. But tonight, for sake of our subject, we can say this: that the wicked is reserved to the day of what? Destruction. They shall be brought forth. To the day of wrath, verse thirty-one. Who shall declare his way to his face? Who shall repay him what he hath done? Now, verse thirty-two says, "Yet shall he be brought to the grave, and shall remain where? In the tomb." If you join me tomorrow night, I'm going to show you what happens. The Bible says there is a resurrection of damnation. I'm going to show you when it is and what happens to those people that are resurrected. So then, why is it that today people think that your soul never dies? Where did this idea come from? It came from Satan in the Garden of Eden. He said to her, he said to Eve, the serpent said unto the woman, "You shall what? Not surely die." Now, do you know all over the world this culture or this idea has permeated Christian, pagan, heathen. All these religions have embraced some element of this idea. Let me share a quick story with you. When I was in、um, when I was in Hawaii, I used to、um, walk by a house on my way to work, where in the front of their house they had it looked like a dollhouse. So it was, but not very deep. It was kind of a dollhouse like this. It's on the front lawn, and in the inside of the dollhouse there was two black and white photos, like a grandma and a grandpa. And every morning, next to this dollhouse, they had incense sticks, and they had plates. And you know, whenever I walked by, depending on when I walked by, the plates were loaded with food. But well, it was mostly like donuts, cookies, candy, you know, like really sweet stuff. But anyway,、uh, every morning when I would walk by, and you know what was interesting? Every day when I would walk home. Pretty much, it was all gone. The birds had come, and they had just kind of eaten everything up. And you know, as I began to understand a little bit of the customs of that particular culture, I discovered that this was ancestor worship. Okay, and if you really think about it carefully, all of the religions of the world they have some element of this idea that the dead are not really dead, and that they're pleased when you do this. But when you study the Bible, the Bible actually says nowhere. That man is innately immortal. It says that nowhere. In fact, the Bible says the opposite. It says, "Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, or the person that sins, it shall what die." I want to ask you. According to the Bible, is the soul mortal, which means subject to death, or immortal, which means not subject to death? Which one? It's subject to death. It's mortal. The soul is mortal. Why would Satan want you to be confused about what happens when you die? Let me explain why. Number one, Satan can copy things. Please notice what the Bible says. It says, "No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into a what? An angel of light." Do you know that Satan can look like a good angel? He used to be a good one. Now he's a fallen angel. If Satan can do that, could he look like your loved one? Yes or no? Absolutely. Could he even? 
talk like them. Yes, could he know things that you thought only they knew? Absolutely. Satan can impersonate. If he can impersonate an angel of light, he can impersonate your loved one, your deceased loved one, your friends, your, your neighbor. He can do that. Today in Christianity, it's alarming, but we have embraced spiritualism. The idea of spiritualism is that you can talk with the dead. You know the Harry Potter movies? It's all based on that, that people, when they die, are not really dead. But the Bible teaches the very opposite of that. And you know, the Bible actually warns Christians about interacting with these things. Please notice Deuteronomy 18, verse 10. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, someone who talks to the dead. For all that do these things are a what? An abomination. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Now, folks, many of you tonight might be thinking, okay, so the dead, according to the Bible, they're in the graves. But I have to clarify one thing. The Bible does say there are some people in heaven right now. There was a man, the Bible says he walked with God every day. And then the Bible says God took him. Who am I talking about? Enoch. Okay, so Enoch is in heaven. There's another man, the Bible says, he got carried away in a chariot of fire. Who is that? Elijah. Another man that's in heaven right now is someone, the Bible says, he was the, it says death reigned from Adam to Moses, which means after Moses, death stopped reigning because Moses was the first person ever resurrected. And that's why when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, he was there with Jesus. But maybe some of you didn't know this. Matthew 27, verse 51, the Bible says, and behold, this is when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, now look closely, and the what? The graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept, what did they do? They arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, where were these saints? They were all in the graves. Do you remember when Jesus called Lazarus? He didn't say, Lazarus, come down. He said, Lazarus, do what? Come forth. Why? Because Lazarus was just in the grave. That's it. So the Bible is telling us that these people, they were in the graves and when Jesus died, there was an earthquake, the grave was open, and then when Jesus resurrected, these people were, were resurrected, and then in four more nights, I'm going to show you what happened to them. The Bible says they went to heaven with Jesus when he ascended. Now, there is one story in the Bible that often confuses people as to the nature of what happens when we die. It's the story of the thief on the cross. I'm going to read it to you. In Luke 23, verse 42, the Bible says, And he said unto Jesus, Lord... Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now, there's something that I have to tell you about this verse. There's two things I have to tell you. The first thing I have to tell you is that in the original manuscripts of the Bible, both Hebrew and Greek, there is no existent punctuation. What did I say? There's no what? There's no punctuation. And here's a fact. The punctuation, the verses, and even the chapter divisions were actually added later by the translators, like 16th century, uh, Robert Stephanus. So the idea is that these, these, um, these, these punctuation marks are actually added afterwards, designed to give clarity to what the translators thought the verse meant. Unfortunately, if you read it the way that verse 43 is punctuated, it actually contradicts other parts of the Bible. Now, I want to make a point here. I want you to imagine in your mind, because I've been getting, I've been getting a view of the, the, I guess the island of Ilo Ilo. Is that right? Anyway, I've been get, I've looked around, you know, the, the, your place here and, this is beautiful land. You know, I've seen some of the fish farms and the rice farms and, you know, so I want you to imagine that you now possess about 50 hectares of just great, perfect rice land, okay? 
And so you bought it, and now you decide, you know what? Uh, you know, we're going to put up some fences because we want to put some animals in here. We don't want them to get out. So obviously this is not what Philippines looks like. But so you start putting some posts in the ground because now those posts are going to be there for you to put your fences together, okay? So you're doing this hard work and you're sweating. And after five or six hours of working, you look off into the distance and you've got all of these posts exactly straight in a line except for one. So what do you do? They're all straight except for one. Now, if you are a smart person, you would go over to the one post that's crooked and you would push it back into place so that it lines up. Does that make sense? If you're not so smart, you might try to move all of the other ones to match the crooked one. <laughs> but I know that you're smart and I know you wouldn't do that. So the question is, how can we make this verse make sense? First of all, when you read what Jesus said on Sunday morning to Mary, you will be sure that Jesus could not have gone to heaven that day with a thief. Because Jesus said to Mary on Sunday, he said, touch me not, for I am not yet, what? Ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, if Jesus is telling the truth, and he is telling the truth, then Jesus could not have said to the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. Because if he said that, then either he was lying to Mary or he was lying to the thief. And Jesus doesn't lie, amen? So then you have to ask yourself, then what, what exactly is this, how do we reconcile this? Remember what I told you, punctuation can make things mean something totally different. Let me show you an example. This was a sign at a restaurant in the United States. Now look closely at the sign. It says, kids under 12 eat free live clown every Wednesday. How many of you are going to let your kids eat a free clown? How many of you? <laughs> Not me. But the point is that what this sign actually was supposed to say is, kids under 12 eat free, comma, live clown every Wednesday. Does that mean something different, yes or no? Absolutely different. Look at this one. It says, for those of you that are married, a woman without her man is nothing. Now that's kind of a, that, you know, I know you have a, you had a female president. Okay. Anyway, if you just put punctuation here, notice how this changes. It says, a woman without her, man is nothing. <laughs> Do you notice that there's no change of words, but punctuation makes a difference. Isn't that true? So what was Jesus saying to the thief? If you really read it carefully, what Jesus was saying was, on that particular Friday, everybody rejected Jesus. His own disciples, they ran away. The priests were mocking him. Some of the people that he had blessed were now part of a group that was now wanting Jesus to be crucified. Can you imagine that in the eyes of the people, Jesus looked mo the, the most, the furthest from being a king? But as Jesus was dying, a thief, looking and realizing who was next to him, in faith he cried out, Lord. Notice he called him Lord. And then he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He realized that Jesus was a king. And as he cried out to Jesus, Jesus, answering the faith of this thief, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you today, Today on this day when no one thinks that I am a king. Today on this day when even my own disciples have betrayed me and have fled. Today on this day when even my own mother does not understand what I am doing. Today I am saying to you that you will be with me in paradise. Jesus was telling the thief that he would be with him when that thief, when Jesus came back to resurrect him. I want to close, I, I've been to England, I pr pretty much go to England every year, and I haven't yet traveled to this cemetery, but in England, there's a cemetery that has one of the most remarkable gravestones that you will ever find. The gravestone was commissioned to be, a, out of stone, a giant door carved out of stone above the grave, above the, the casket. So instead of like a, you know, a, a gravestone, they carved out of granite, they carved a giant door into the ground. So it's a door, it has a handle, there's a keyhole. 
But carved on top of this door, the artist was commissioned to carve a giant angel that kneels above the door. And as this angel kneels above the door, he has one hand on the key, which is in the keyhole of that door. Can you see this in your mind? So there's a door over the ground, and there's an angel that kneels above this grave. He has one hand on the key, which is in the keyhole, but the, uh, the face of the angel is carved to point to the horizon. And as the face points to the horizon, the other hand of the angel is carved so as to shield what appears to be a blinding light that shines off in the distance. Can you see this so far? And so there on this tombstone, there's no name. There is no inscription except for three simple words. The gravestone with this door and an angel who peers off into the horizon facing east. The only words on this tombstone, the three simple words, it says, till he comes. Do you understand, folks? You see what that's saying is when Jesus comes, all of the graves will be broken open. And if you have died in Christ, you too will be privy to see those angels that will come to gather the righteous when Jesus comes. Friend, I don't know about you, but I want Jesus to come. Amen? Death is but a sleep. If you've ever had a hard day of work, and then you take a nice shower and you lay down, and very soon, before you know it, all you hear is the alarm clock ringing to wake you up. That essence, where you don't experience the passage of time, this is exactly why the Bible calls death a sleep. But friends, make no mistake, when Jesus comes, that sleep will be over. And I'm waiting for that day. How about you? I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me as we close and prepare for our presentation for tomorrow night. Father in heaven, we are thankful for Jesus, who has the keys of hell and of death. Lord, there are some today that may have lost hope. Maybe death is a nameless fear, an emptiness, a darkness beyond which there is no light. But tonight, the truth of Scripture shines brightly, and it points us to hope in Jesus, the resurrection and the life. Father, we give our lives to you, and we ask that Jesus would give us hope for our lost loved ones. And we pray that you would continue to teach us as we study your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.